الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Respected professors and students at the Tanaga National University here in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. Our topic tonight is entitled Islam, the United Nations Organization, and the New World Order. And I'm particularly happy to have a chance to address this subject before a gathering of university students. Because you do need some measure of thought capacity for thinking to be able to deal with this subject. We will be taking journeys into the philosophy of science, into the philosophy of history, into political philosophy, into the history of international relations, and most of all into a branch of knowledge that you are familiar with as Ilmu Akhirul Zaman but which is known as eschatology the study of the end times and to tie all of these branches of knowledge together does require an effort in thought so do sit down and relax as we embark on our journey on addressing the subject of Islam, the United Nations Organization and the New World Order. I gave a lecture on this subject in October 1987 which makes it about 24, 25 years ago in Pretoria in South Africa and since then I have not lectured on this subject <laughs> but the recording of that lecture which is on the internet and YouTube the quality of recording is so poor that I was receiving requests to do please come back to the subject so we can get a better recording. And we have with us, with us, with us tonight someone who has chosen the, the very uh, flavory name of Ice Maker. And he's here. And he's the one who records and within 24 hours it's on YouTube. <laughs> he's right here. Our brother is Hark and may Allah bless him for the wonderful work he's been doing these last few months that I've been here in Malaysia. And so there are going to be people in France who are going to be listening to this lecture. And people in North Africa. And in the United States and in Pakistan, many parts of the world are going to be listening to this lecture. And we pray that Allah may bless him through whom the recordings are put on YouTube so quickly and in such excellent quality 
Amin New world orders have been constantly unfolding there's not one and even now we are on the brink of the emergence of yet another new world order while you were busy with your exams Israel is pre preparing to attack Iran we don't know when the attack will take place but we feel fairly certain that it's going to come and when the attack does take place a new world order is going to unfold one of the first casualties of such an attack would be the collapse of the US dollar you don't need a PhD to understand that this book of mine the gold dinar and silver dirham Islam and the future of money explains our perspective on monetary economics you must be wondering how come somebody with a hat like this and a beard like this and dress like this antiquated old-fashioned clothing how come he has specialization in monetary economics we're not accustomed to that and that's our problem today scholars of Islam who are out of touch with the modern world of knowledge the collapse of the US dollar will bring about the collapse of the US economy the euro is also falling but all the weak currencies in the world are going to collapse and there's going to be panic around the world an attack on Iran is going to lead to several other wars and these several wars are going to witness in my opinion the transfer of power in the world from the second of the Jal's ruling states I've mentioned his name for the first time al Masih al-Dajjal from the second of the Jal's ruling states and you have of course read Jerusalem in the Quran here we are the first ruling state Britain the second ruling state Uncle Sam <laughs> and the third and final ruling state which will emerge in consequence of big wars which are now going to unfold namely the state of Israel so a new world order is around the corner <laughs> and then at the end of a day which is like a week according to the hadith and you have to be able to go to the Quran so that the Quran can explain to you the world in which you live today and you have to be able to go to the hadith so that Nabi Muhammad wasalam, can explain to you the world in which you live today and tomorrow which is coming and that's the failure of Islamic scholarship today the incapacity to use the Quran and to use the hadith of the Nabi Muhammad wasalam, to understand the reality which confronts us today it's a question of methodology I'm sorry to start off on such a difficult note well let's take the difficult part first so the rest will be easy it's a question of methodology we have a movement in the world today which describes itself as Salafi and they are my brothers and I speak of them respectfully you don't get disrespect from me for them who insist as the Protestants do the religion is actually reducible to texts not the stuff that you do with a cell phone eh, to send text messages 
that religion is ultimately reducible to texts, namely the written word of the Quran, the written word of the Ahadith. And that these texts must be understood and interpreted literally. Once you hold that methodology, you're going to be waiting a long, long time for Dajjal's donkey. Have I spoken to you about his donkey? It's not a laughing matter. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, about al-Masih al-Dajjal, or the false messiah, that he's going to ride on a donkey. And the donkey will travel as fast as the clouds. And the donkey will have his ears stretched out wide. And thank Allah that I have so many students of engineering here tonight. Those who hold this Protestant view of Islam insist that he will come on a donkey. And they're waiting on that flying donkey. That's the problem of methodology. We understand, however, this to be religious symbolism. And we do not hesitate having recognized it to be religious symbolism, to interpret it as the modern aircraft. As a consequence of which, our methodology allows us to understand the new world orders that are unfolding. Our methodology allows us to describe today accurately and to anticipate tomorrow with a certain degree of accuracy. And so this methodology is delivering the goods. And people around the world are recognizing it. And all that we can do to our Salafi brothers, and they are our brothers, is do please take another look at our methodology. Because this is a tree that is producing the fruit. Momentous change came out, came about in Europe, and not by accident. When a scientific and technological revolution made its appearance in the world. In consequence of that scientific and technological revolution, you now have today the Tanaga National University. It started from Britain. You must be familiar with Boyd's Law. Students of physics, yeah? It started from Britain, with the steam engine, for example. But along with that scientific and technological revolution came a philosophy of science. The knowledge, knowledge comes from the scientific method. That only that qualifies as knowledge, which is based on observation, external observation and scientific inquiry, and rational inquiry. And whatever did not come from this method does not qualify as knowledge. It belongs to a place in Orlando called Disneyland. And so the Quran is just another written book. We're not concerned in evaluating its claim to be the word of the unseen God. We are prepared to accept it as a book which came from this man, Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And so the world of the sacred disappears when you embrace the scientific method. And so the spiritual foundations of religion are destroyed when you embrace the scientific method. And then a Protestant version of religion emerges. The scientific revolution 
brought about a challenge to the world of faith in Europe with reason rivaling faith that there was a compati incompatibility between science and religion you're familiar with this if you're university students and that struggle between science and faith between science and religion between the university and the Vatican ended ultimately with victory for science victory for reason over religion and over faith in consequence of that victory a new civilization emerged in Europe Christendom vanished Christendom which recognized Allah's sovereignty or God's sovereignty that he is the sovereign the supreme authority lies with him European Christianity I'm talking about and that if an emperor is to be crowned it is the Pope who must crown him otherwise he would not have legitimacy this political philosophy based on religion disappeared and in its place came modern Western secular civilization with a new political philosophy to the effect that we no longer recognize divine sovereignty no sovereignty now resides with the state with the people it's called republicanism I'm not talking about a political party that George Bush used to lead <laughs> republicanism the Republican state Plato's Republic the Republican state recognizes sovereignty and supreme authority residing here in the state and not there any schoolboy who's had even a passing acquaintance with the Quran much less for you university students will recognize that as shirk the Malay say shirk please change your pronunciation <laughs> it's shirk in English it's called blasphemy Allah is a merciful God you know that and he said tell my servants even if you come to me with sins as high as the clouds that's a lot of sins eh? I'll forgive them all inna Allah yaghfiru zunuba jami'a so even George Bush has some hope <laughs> and Tony Blair they were just convicted here in KL you know for war crimes Allah is prepared to forgive all sins but there's one sin that he would not forgive and that is shirk and in Sahih Bukhari there are four a hadith not one four which tells us the Al-Mu'akhir al-Zaman Islamic eschatology that at the end of the world judgment day would come and on judgment day Allah will speak to Adam alayhi salam and say to him take out or separate the people for the hellfire or Jahannam and Adam alayhi salam would ask how many are they for the hellfire and he would reply subhanahu wa ta'ala take 999 out of every 1000 for the hellfire 
This is Sahih Bukhari, incidentally. A hadith which is mutawatir from different chains of narrators. And therefore very strong hadith. And tonight we ask the question, how can a God who is merciful, who is Ar-Rahman, who is Ar-Rahim, who is Al-Ghafar, who is for forgiving, and who is prepared to forgive all sins, how can he consign 999 out of every 1,000 for the hellfire? There's only one answer. No go searching for any other answer. The only possible answer is that this is taking place because of shirk. Only shirk can explain this. And this is what modern Western civilization gave to the world in a new political philosophy which took sovereignty away, which no longer recognized sovereignty as residing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Al-Malik, a term that you are familiar with, Al-Malik, the sovereign. They say the king. But in political terminology, we'd say the sovereign. And as Al-Hakam, the one whose law is supreme, and as Al-Akbar, Al-Akbar, the one whose authority is supreme. This did not happen by accident. The emergence of this new world order in which Christendom collapsed and the modern secular state, which called itself the Republican state, emerged in history based on the foundations of shirk okay you're going to have to sit down now while and junaid <coughs> the scientific and technological revolution also gave to Europe power that could be applied to military science. It didn't happen by accident. It was Dajjal at work in political philosophy and it is Dajjal at work in military science as well. So that Europe was suddenly blessed with power that the rest of the world combined could not stand up to. Are you beginning to understand history now? And then European armies spread out around the world without any regard whatsoever for laws of war and peace based on justice. No. They had an obsession of taking control of the rest of the world. They had a racism which led them to believe that they were the chosen people of God Almighty. The white man. We have with us an American here tonight who traveled all the way from the United States to be with us tonight. Our brother Nathan, who we got him a new name today, Usman, inshallah. So welcome your brother when the program is ended. The white man, and I'm talking generally now, I don't mean every single white man. The white man now presented himself to mankind as a superior human being belonging to a superior race and the rest of us were just natives who had to be, excuse me, civilized. 
In the classroom of political science, my teacher, Professor Leslie Manigat of Haiti, when I was studying international relations, he used the term jingoism <laughs> for this. And so they spread all around the world and they colonized the rest of the world at the point of a bloody sword. While yet throwing upon us out of some dustbin or garbage bin the lie that Islam was spread at the point of the sword. There's a little booklet at the back. I'm sorry, I did not know we're going to have such a big gathering tonight. So we only brought a few copies of our books. But there's a little book outside entitled George Bernard Shaw and the Islamic Scholar. When George Bernard Shaw met with my teacher's teacher, Maulana Abdul Alim Siddiqui, Rahim of Allah, 1935 in Mombasa, the first question he asked Maulana, Maulana, I heard you spoke last night on religion. Islam, the religion of peace? That's strange to me, Maulana, because Islam is the religion of war. You, you spread Islam at the point of the sword. This is George Bernard Shaw. Read that conversation and read the answer that the Maulana gave him and put him in his place. And so they colonized the rest of the world. But they never decolonized before they had destroyed whatever institutions there were in the world which obstructed them in their obsession of establishing one world order over which they would have control. And so the Khilafah had to go. Because the Khilafah, I don't know whether you remember the term. It's been so long, so long before all of you were born that you probably have forgotten it as now, but forgotten it now. Hmm? And tomorrow when we'll all be eating McDonald's hamburgers, we probably will forget what is Ruchi Chennai as well. <laughs> <laughs> the Khilafah was our model of a state and our model of a system of political organization and a, 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 a conception of an international order. Not only a system of political organization, but more than that, a conception of an international order. That Khilafah state had to go. Had to go by the hook or by the crook. Eventually it went by the crook a crook named Mustafa Kemal. Those in Turkey who are listening to this lecture are going to be shocked. But this is facts and facts have to be spoken. What Mustafa Kemal did on behalf of his masters in the Western world was to preside over the destruction of the Khilafah, the institution of the Khilafah so that the rival institution which came out of modern western civilization could replace it, the secular state or the republican state of Turkey. Let us briefly describe the Khilafah, which disappeared in 1924, but which is coming back tomorrow. Oh yes, whether they like it or they don't. The Security Council of the UN could do what they want. The Khilafah is coming back tomorrow. And I pray Allah to send me students who will have backbones made out of steel, not recycled paper. They'll have the courage to stand up and proclaim the truth 
in the faces of the world's greatest tyrants and bandits who today rule the world. Life and death are in Allah's hands. How many are they going to send to Guantanamo? Can they silence the scholars of Islam? No! Not those who truly follow Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Victory is for truth. And you have a mountain of lies. You cannot compete with truth. The Khilafah state not only recognize Allah's sovereignty, and it will return when Imam al-Mahdi emerges and Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns. This is Islamic eschatology. The Khilafah state also recognized Allah's supreme law. And what Allah made haram was enforced as haram. And what Allah made halal was enforced as halal. Today we live in a world in consequence of this modern secular state which has replaced the Khilafah state. In which every single thing that Allah made haram has now been made halal. Everything. Shamelessly. Allah prohibited money being lent on interest, didn't he? And so money lending on interest was haram. <laughs> And the very last revelation to come down in the Quran, it's a book that you'd be interested in picking up and looking at sometimes. The very last revelation which came down in the Quran is one in which Allah declared war, war on those who consume riba. One form of riba, of course, is money being lent on interest. You don't need a PhD to understand that. And around you, everywhere in the world today, you have a banking system which came from the job, which lends money and interest. And the rip-off has already taken place. And the enslavement of many of mankind has already taken place in consequence of that banking system. But that's finance and monetary economics. If you make halal what Allah made haram, that is also shirk. In Surah to Tawbah of the Quran, Allah says, بَعَدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ اِتَّخَذُوا أَهْبَارَهُمْ وَرُهْبَانَهُمْ أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَالْمَسِيحَ بْنَ مَرْيَمَ وما أمر إلا أعبد إله واحد لا إله إلا هو سبحانه عما يشركون. They took their priests and they took their rabbis as gods and lords beside Allah. And they did the same with the Messiah, the son of Mary. But they had not been ordered other than to worship one God. There is no God but Him. Glory be to Him. Far removed is He from this shirk. Of worshipping your priests and our rabbis and your maulanas and your ustad and your sheikh as Lord and God beside Allah. So a man came to the Prophet والسلام, and said, O Messenger of Allah, but the Christians do not worship their priests. How could Allah say so? And the Jews do not worship their rabbis. How could Allah say so? To which the Prophet ﷺ replied and said, Did they not make halal what Allah made haram? That is their shirk. And did the people not accept it and follow it? That is their shirk. So if the modern world has made halal, the lending of money on interest, it's legal. You won't be arrested. <laughs> if you lend money on interest. No, no bankers are arrested today. If you make halal, you make legal what Allah made haram, that's shirk. And so the Khilafah state enforced 
allows law as the supreme law. And the Khilafah state submitted to Allah's authority. His authority was supreme. For Allah says, for example, in Surah An-Nisa, Atiullah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who have faith in Allah, Atiullah, obey Allah. That's one. Wa atiyu rasul and obey the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam number two wa ulil amri minkum and obey those in authority amongst you not as my teacher points out Mawlana Fadlur Rahman Ansari rahimahullah not authority which comes out of the barrel of a gun no it has to be lawfully constituted authority which means authority constituted on the basis of Allah's law, then you have an obligation to obey that authority. Hmm? And so the Khilafah state recognized Allah's supreme authority, and then after him the authority of the Prophet, and after him the authority of the state. And this could not be inconsistent with that and with that. The Khilafah state also recognized the unity of the Ummah and preserved the unity of the Ummah. How did it do so? It recognized all territory under the control of the Amir al-Mu'minim to be something called Darul Islam. Never heard of it before. Darul Islam. This vocabulary has disappeared. And in its place you have popcorn. <laughs> yeah. This is the intellectual ignorance in which we now live today. And it is a function of Islamic scholarship to teach the people and bring them back to the truth. The Khilafah state recognized this territory to be Darul Islam. And once a territory is Darul Islam, every Muslim, including Nathan who's come from St. Francisco, every Muslim has the right to enter the territory of Darul Islam. You don't need a visa. Did you know that? Huh? You don't need a visa. All you need is La ilaha illallah. And you can enter the territory of Darul Islam. Well, why don't you try to go before some immigration officer? <laughs> <laughs> Pakistan, Islamic Republic of Pakistan, excuse me. Uh, and uh, Islamic Iran. And when you reach the immigration officer, you say, La ilaha illallah. <laughs> See whether you have right of entry. <laughs> Every Muslim had the right to reside in the territory of Darul Islam. You don't need a residence permit. Every Muslim has the right to seek livelihood in Darul Islam. You don't need a work permit. And every Muslim has the right who is Sakin, not Musafir to participate in the political process, shura, on the basis of political equality with all other Muslims. You don't need something called citizenship. Whether they like it or they don't, it is absolutely irrelevant now that the sun is about to set. This is coming back to the world of Islam. So your Egyptian nationalism and your Pakistani nationalism and your so many other nationalisms will return to the garbage bin from where it emerged in the first place and would be replaced with the fraternity of Islam, inshallah. They never left, they never decolonized until they had remove all obstacles in their way in their pursuit of their ultimate goal of one world 
under their control and one world government with which they would rule the world and that's why the Khilafah had to go and had to be replaced with something else and in its place came the modern Republican state the modern secular Republican state <coughs> with which you are all familiar it broke up the world of Islam <laughs> into bits and pieces like Pakistan today is not going to be the same tomorrow if they succeed maybe in another month or two the attack will come only Allah does not make mistakes okay but they want to attack Pakistan not only to destroy the nuclear plants and nuclear weapons because Muslims are not supposed to have those kind of weapons only Israel only Israel not Muslims and since Pakistan does possess nuclear weapons and nuclear plants that's why they have to invade it and destroy it and they want to get a civil war going in Pakistan so you can use that as an excuse but when they're finished with that and given the pathetic pathetic state of the leadership not the men in the ranks of the armed forces the leadership they seem look they look to me like Zionists in Pakistan and the political leadership as well not the people the people love Islam it seems to me that this kind of pathetic leadership that Pakistan has had all these years makes it possible for them the enemy to succeed with their plans but they want to do more than that they want to break up Egypt into bits and pieces uh, sorry break up Pakistan into bits and pieces because it's easier than for India to establish its hegemony <laughs> over the bits and pieces they want to do the same thing with Egypt attack Egypt from this side Israel attack Egypt from that side which side? <laughs> there used to be a man in Libya who opposed the Zionists I don't know if you remember him <laughs> and they took Muslims they took Muslims and they deceived these Muslims and they made an alliance with these Muslims and these are the fellows who are now in charge to make an alliance with NATO, Zionist NATO to overthrow this leader and this government in Libya so that Libya is now under NATO control so when they're ready NATO will attack Egypt from the west and break up Egypt into bits and pieces the whole Arab world is going to be attacked like that why? because they want to rule the world and they decolonized after they had put in place the political institutions the economic institutions like banking the monetary institutions like the bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper currency that we now have all of us and only after they had put these in place did they decolonize with the certainty now that they can continue to rule by proxy P R O X Y come on give me the Bahasa word for proxy he's searching in his pocket now <laughs> proxy huh? by proxy Wakil Wakil okay by proxy in consequence of their success in replacing the Khilafah with the modern Republican secular state Dajjal brought into the world a new world order how did Islamic scholarship respond 
We don't have time tonight to look at the economic response. We don't have time tonight to look at the monetary response. We don't have time tonight to look at the educational response, the institutions of educational studies. We're talking about the political response in terms of political philosophy. The most significant response that came out of the world of Islamic scholarship came from India. An Indian scholar named Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, a man of eminent scholarship. I consider him to be my teacher, although I never met him. I was born many years after his death. Dr. Iqbal is a towering scholar of Islam, worthy of profound respect. And he took on Western scholarship. That scientific uh, method that we spoke about earlier, that if it did not come from observation and from scientific experimentation, it's not knowledge. It belongs to a place in Orlando called Disneyland. He took on this Western, I'm going to use a big word now, he challenged this Western epistemology or the branch of knowledge which studies knowledge. He challenged it in a profound response, the best that was ever penned by any scholar of Islam. In the first two chapters of his book entitled the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, but I suggest that you go to the pharmacy and buy a bottle of Tylenol tablets <laughs> if you want to read that book. It's not easy. As a master's degree student in philosophy, I had to study that book. I read it 20 times without, un without understanding it. <laughs> and only when I studied Surah al Kaf of the Quran, only then was I able to understand those first two chapters of Iqbal. Hmm? So, we, the world of Islam has a tremendous depth of gratitude to Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. Remember the book, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam? You don't have to go and buy the book, just go to the internet and type in Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam and you'll get the nine chapters of the book there and read the first two. But in that same book, Dr. Iqbal made a monumental <coughs> mistake. And it is no disrespect whatsoever to point out a mistake made by a scholar. It does not diminish our admiration of his scholarship. Everybody can make mistakes. And I certainly do not want students who will accept everything that I say uncritically. No, those are dangerous students. I much prefer to have students who will never accept anything that I say until you first studied it carefully and only when you are convinced that it is the truth, only then do you understand it, you accept it. And if you're not convinced, don't accept it. Iqbal declared while commenting on the events in Turkey the collapse of the Ottoman Islamic Empire and its replacement in 1924 with the secular state of Turkey. He commented on what he calls the admirable Turkish Ijtihad. That the Republican state can function as a substitute for the Khilafah. He never made a bigger mistake in his whole life. And because of that mistake that Iqbal made, so many have since then been misguided in accepting the modern secular state and accepting the system of elections of the modern secular state to form a government that will preside over the shirk. 
we now have even Islamic parties. I gather you have one right here in Malaysia. And you have them in Tunisia. You have them in Egypt. You have them, the most famous one of all, of course, is in Turkey. And these Islamic parties believe that you can register the Islamic movement as a political party under the constitution of the secular state and then fight in elections like everybody else fight in elections and if you win the elections and you take power then you have a gradual movement you know you allow the alcohol for some time and allow the nightclubs and so on for some time because you don't want to rock the boat do you until eventually incrementally you'll be able to somehow with a philosophy called abracadabra <laughs> bring Islam where is Islamic scholarship today is this the Sunnah that you walk the road of shirk to bring Islam Minds has been a voice crying in the wilderness for a long, long time. For a long, long time I was saying the US dollar is collapse, it's going to collapse. And they laughed at me. I gather they're not laughing at me anymore now. No. For a long, long time since this book appeared I told them Israel wants to rule the world. And Israel wants to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. And they laughed at me. Well, when Israel attacks Iran, let's see who's going to laugh. The, the Western world, with the mastermind being the Dajjal, then needed an international organization that will bring all these secular states, all these republican states under one umbrella. And once you embrace them under one umbrella, you are able to now control them all. And you are on your way to world government. One world government. They started the process with something called the League of Nations which had its headquarters in Geneva, the city where I studied international relations, Geneva. But then the, the League of Nations collapsed because the United States refused to enter the League of Nations. And then came the Second World War and when the Second World War was concluding they gathered the victors in San Francisco, was it San Francisco? To establish the United Nations organization. This was 1944, I believe. Um, every state in the world now had to become a member of the United Nations organization. And if you refuse to become a member of the United Nations organization, you're in plenty trouble. They will take action against you and punish you and punish you and punish you. I don't know how much you know about your history, about when Malaysia was born. You're too young. And Sokarno, Ahmad Sokarno, out of anger, because he felt this was a British imperial creation took Indonesia out of the UN did you know that? but <laughs> it didn't survive for long and Indonesia had to go back into the UN to the best of my knowledge the only state which stayed out of the UN for a long long time and was not punished was Switzerland but after Switzerland had done the work that Switzerland knew, know that it has done, I no need to tell you what it was, it then became necessary for Switzerland as well to join the United Nations organization. The United Nations organization was structured with a lower house like parliament, you know, senate and the house of representatives, 
So the United Nations organization was structured like that. That all the states of the world will become members of the General Assembly. And in the General Assembly they will all be recognized to be politically equal. So a little Trinidad and Tobago where I was born, next door to Venezuela, with a population of uh, about 1.3 million. Huh? This little Trinidad and Tobago has a political status equal to the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Huh? Did you hear that? And there are some other states in the Caribbean which are less than that. Grenada, the island of Grenada probably has about 90,000 people. Less than PJ. <laughs> less than PJ. <laughs> and little Grenada has a political status of political equality with the entire Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. This is the nonsense that we accepted in the charter of the United Nations organization. Is this what you have done to the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? By accepting this nonsense? But the General Assembly of the United Nations Organization did not have any power to enforce any resolutions. It was a talk shop. But the Security Council of the United Nations was a different matter. The Zionists who created the United Nations Organization on Dajjal's behalf made sure that they took control of the Security Council. The Security Council had authority. Let me read for you. In order, Article 24, remember Allah is al Akbar. But this charter is saying, no, Allah is not al Akbar. The Security Council is al Akbar. Whoever has supreme authority. Supreme authority means there is no other authority above it. No. That is al Akbar. Allah is al Akbar. You cannot perform salat. You cannot move in salat without saying Allahu Akbar. Well, listen to who is al Akbar. Article 24. I quote In order to ensure prompt and effective action by the United Nations, its members, including the entire Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, incidentally, its members confer on the Security Council primary responsibility, meaning supreme responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. In all matters pertaining to war and peace in the world, the Security Council of the United Nations has primary responsibility, meaning supreme responsibility. Meaning the authority of the Security Council is supreme. Is there any authority above the Security Council? Where is it? On the moon? Huh? Where is it? There is no authority in the world today recognized above the Security Council of the UN. And so the Security Council of the UN is al Akbar. If you don't believe me, wait until you get in your grave. <laughs> they wanted to put a nail in the coffin. So he had listened to Article 25. The members of the United Nations, which includes the entire Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, agree to accept and to carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the present charter. Even when the Security Council 
gives an order which is in conflict with what Allah and His Messenger have ordered you have an obligation to obey the Security Council and so they succeeded and they succeeded splendidly in selling this institution of the United Nations organization to the entire world and getting the entire world to submit to their authority in the Security Council binding resolutions of the Security Council I wonder who are the Security Council who are the Security Council the Security Council is divided into two parts very cunningly on their part Dajjal is a mastermind there are the permanent members of the Security Council permanent means even in Bahasa it means forever and ever forever and ever and ever and ever and there are five in number five and uh, the other uh, members are called the non-permanent members and they are elected for terms of two years hmm? decisions of the security council are taken by a majority vote but if a permanent member of the security council votes against the resolution then they use what is known as a veto they needed to have that there to save Israel the United States of America has used the veto so many times we've lost count in protecting Israel who are the members of the Security Council permanent members before we answer that question it will be interesting for you if I were to go to the Quran to Surah Al-Ma'idah of the Quran and listen to what the Quran has to say about the world today Allah says Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu O you who have faith in Allah La tattakhidhu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies we probably have some Christians present here tonight do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies question let's stop there before we go to the rest of the verse is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians or is he speaking about some Jews and some Christians problem here is methodology if you use the defective methodology I call it the lazy man's methodology of studying a verse of the Quran in isolation no scientist does that huh? take a verse of the Quran in isolation by itself stand alone to derive its meaning if you do that then you have to come to the conclusion he's talking about all Jews and all Christians but if you use the proper methodology which every scientist does to go to the totality of the data and organize the totality of the data into a meaningful organic whole harmonious whole then you look at what is a system of meaning which binds that data all together when you do that in this case so we don't have the time to do it you'll then realize no not at all Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians for example in the same Surah Al-Ma'idah he says وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَ and you will most certainly find in time to come that those who are closest of all to you in friendship and love 
in love and friendship would be those who say we are Christians. So George Bush don't qualify him. <laughs> and Tony Blair don't qualify him. Because they are enemies, not friends. Those who will be closest in love and affection to you in time to come would be those who say we are Christians. This is the Quran. So how can you say to those who are closest in love and affection to you, we can't be friends with you, it doesn't make sense, does it? And so Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. Well then, if he's not speaking about all Jews and all Christians, which Jews and which Christians is he talking about? From the time you ask that question, the words which follow give you the answer. لا تتخذ اليهود والنصارى أولياء بعدهم أولياء بعض. That is the answer. Is there بعدهم أولياء بعض. Meaning, do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies. Who themselves are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is saying that in a time to come, the Quran is anticipating that in a time to come there's going to be a mysterious reconciliation between part of the Christian world and part of the Jewish world. And there will emerge in the world a mysterious Judeo-Christian alliance. Friendship and alliance. When that happens, then Allah is prohibiting you from being friends and allies of those Christians and Jews who established the Judeo-Christian alliance. Not an individual Christian who has a Jewish neighbor. Don't be foolish. <laughs> Has that alliance come into being? If you have not recognized it, you're eating too much roti chanai. <laughs> huh? Yes, it has. A mysterious Judeo Christian alliance has emerged in the world thanks to the relentless efforts of the Vatican. Efforts which are still continuing up to now. And it is a Zionist alliance. It is a Zionist alliance. It is that Zionist alliance which is responsible for overturning. Well, at that time it was not known as a Zionist alliance. It was known as Jewish-Christian collaboration for overturning European Christendom and bringing into being modern Western secular civilization. But only in the 19th century did they actually establish the Zionist movement. When the first crusades took place, for example, I was not aware until I learned that the Jews financed the crusades. <laughs> Yes, so Christian-Jewish collaboration in Europe was taking place for a long, long time. When the Jewish-Christian Zionist alliance emerged in the world, uh, these are the ones who have continuously been waging war on Islam. And Allah says in the Quran, in the words which follow, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance. We are friends of America. <laughs> okay, go ahead and make that statement. Wait until you get in your grave and you'll see. <laughs> Whoever turns to them for friendship and alliance, you've lost your Islam. 
you've lost your Islam you now belong to them this is the Quran in Allah la yahdil qawmadhali means surely Allah does not provide guidance for a people who, whose trademark is wickedness so look now let's go to the permanent members of the security council number one is a Zionist state the first ruling state created by Dajjal was Britain a day like a year you've read this book haven't you a day like a year and Britain is a permanent member of the Security Council the second permanent member of the Security Council is another Zionist state the United States of America <laughs> which is the current ruling state established by Dajjal it looks as though Dajjal is establishing the Security Council by himself all alone. The third permanent member of the Security Council is France, another Zionist state. So the Zionists have three out of five. And all three are Christian states which have alliance with the Jews. Hmm? But then came number four, Russia. And Russia is a European state. And Russia used to be fervently Christian. And that Christianity that Russia has is the Christianity that the Quran refers to as, as Rom. Don't tell me, eh? that the room in the Quran is a city in Italy <laughs> please don't do that <laughs> the Christianity that Russia has is the Eastern Christianity this one had its capital in Constantinople which is now known as Istanbul that one is Western Christianity which has its capital in Rome and then they broke up and Protestants moved away and so on. That one celebrates something called Christmas. You've heard about Christmas? On the 25th of December. But this one celebrates Christmas on January 9th, I believe. They're different from each other. So, Eastern Christianity established itself in the foundations of Russia until the same revolution that came over Western Europe with the French Revolution transforming Christendom into the modern secular civilization that same revolution came to Russia with the Bolshevik Revolution which destroyed the foundations of the Christian church in Russia and brought into being a new secular state in Russia that Russia is also a member of the Security Council of the United Nations with Veda power I studied the subject of Gog and Magog an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world Gog and Magog are in the Quran Allah gave to Gog and Magog power that none could fight them and defeat them other than Allah. And I came to the conclusion that Russia and the Russian-led alliance is Magog. And the American-led alliance is Gog. This is my conclusion. You don't have to agree with me. No need to pick up boxing gloves if you don't agree with me. And so both Gog and Magog are in the Security Council. <laughs> <laughs> and then they chose to, to include China as well and that baffled me because this is Christian, this is Christian, this is Christian, this is Christian as well all four and then I remember that the China that was admitted to the Security, to the security Council was a China led by Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek Chiang Kai-shek who was Christian he was Christian. 
So China also at that time was led by a Christian government. Hmm? This is the Security Council of the United Nations dominated by the Zionists. And Allah has prohibited Muslims, prohibited Muslims from maintaining friendly ties and entering into the embrace of that Judeo-Christian alliance. And guess what we did? <laughs> guess what we did? Huh? While I was while I was, our scholars, our ulama were eating roti chanai. <laughs> yes, the greatest failure of all in the ummah today is not our political leaders, not our economic leaders, not our educational leaders. The greatest failure in the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam today is the, the failure of our religious leadership. Incapacity to recognize this as shirk. Incapacity to recognize that the Quran is prohibiting us from entering into the embrace of the United Nations organization. No fatwa. No scholarly work. None. Examining the Charter of the United Nations. None. Much less for the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> and so, here we are at this very last hour when the sun is about to set. With the United Nations organization have be, having been successfully used. Successfully used to establish Zionist political and economic dominion over the entire world of Islam. They just, yes, just rest, yesterday, they used the United Nations resolution, Security Council resolution, to enter into Libya and bomb Libya to the Stone Age, take over Libya's oil and put it to their use now. This, this just happened yesterday. Hmm? because of a resolution of the Security Council and every single Muslim country which is a member of the United Nations is obliged to obey, submit to the authority of the Security Council. Before we end, what is the new world order that is to come after Israel attacks Iran and the US dollar collapses and the US economy collapses? And then uh, several wars take place and the United States is brought to the brink of military defeat. Please listen to my lecture which I gave on Sunday night, uh, an Islamic view of the imminent Zionist Israeli attack on Iran, which uh, Ice Maker has already put on YouTube. And in that lecture you'll get far more information on the subject of implications of the attack coming attack on Iran and Israel takes over from the United States as the next ruling state in the world and in the same way that Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica so too will Pax Judaica it's not Pax at all it's not peace it's war Pax Judaica will now replace Pax Americana why does Israel want to rule the world? What will be the implications of Israel taking over the rule of the world from the United States? Answer, Israel wants to rule the world so that a man can stand up in Jerusalem tomorrow. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam described that man to us 1400 years ago. He said he will be a young man indicating that in Akhir zaman the young are going to rule. He'll be a young man, he'll be a Jew. He'll be powerfully built, he'll have curly hair. And he will declare that I am the Messiah. And in order for the Jews to accept him as the Messiah, he has to rule the world. Because the scripture said that the Messiah will rule the world. And Nabi Muhammad said 
that when the Messiah comes back, we know who is our Messiah, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, he will be Hakim, one who rules, with a rule which cannot be challenged by any Tom, Dick or Harry. So this fellow, who is the false Messiah, who is Dajjal, tomorrow will stand up in Jerusalem and make that declaration. In order for his declaration to have to, to convince the Jews, he has to rule the world. The problem is, there's a fly in the ointment. You see, Allah created two, Gog and Magog. And Russia is not going to bend its knee to Israel. And China is not going to bend its knee to Israel. And so you're going to face world war with thousands of nuclear weapons being uh, used. That's coming. That's coming. What the Zionists are doing is taking mankind to the ultimate disaster. A disaster in which all the cities of the world are going to be destroyed. Is Imran Hussein exaggerating now? When he speaks about all the cities of the world being destroyed? Huh? I wonder. Let's take a look at the Quran, shall we? Surah Al-Isra. And listen to what Allah says. وَإِمْ مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ إِلَّا نَحْنُ مُهْلِكُوهَا قَبْلَ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَإِمْ مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ إِلَّا نَحْنُ مُهْلِكُوهَا قَبْلَ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ أَوْ مُعَذِّبُهَا عَذَابًا شَلِيلًا كَانَ ذَلِكَ كان ذلك في الكتاب مصطورة and not a single town or city will escape but Allah will destroy them all and those which escape destruction will be punished with terrible punishment and this is something inscribed in the kitab and so that coming clash figured off because the Zionists want to rule the world is going to destroy most of mankind but they don't care they want to rule the world it is at that time that he declares that I am the Messiah at that time that Imam al-Mahdi will emerge and with the emergence of Imam al-Mahdi the Khilafah will come back do you believe for one silly moment that Imam al-Mahdi is going to sit in the General Assembly of the United Nations? Huh? Because he's not allowed in the Security Council. <laughs> no, no Muslim, no Muslim country could have a permanent membership in the Security Council. No. It's Britain, United States, France, Russia and China, the world of Islam, out. You can come and sit for two years and then out you go. <laughs> That's where the Ummah of the Prophet is today. Do you for one silly moment believe that Imam al-Mahdi is going to submit to the authority of the Security Council in accordance with the Charter that I've written? Just read. What a silly moment that would be. No. When Imam al-Mahdi emerges, our system of political organization will be restored. The Khilafah will be restored. And our conception of an international order, which I have not been able to describe for you tonight, will also be restored. And that would be the last world order, in which truth will triumph over falsehood. And those today who are being oppressed and all that they have in their hands are stones with which to match the tanks of the oppressors on that day truth will triumph over falsehood and justice will tri triumph over tyranny and oppression this has been our talk on Islam the United Nations organization and the new world order and if there's one lesson that comes out of it is that we have failed to study the Quran and we have failed 
to study the word of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it is time for us to correct that mistake Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tub alayna ya mawlana inna ka anta tawab rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin Ameen First of all, in this uh, political world, our, our political world, let's say in Malaysia, when you mention about the political party, uh, mainly, let's say, PAS, the Muslim party in Malaysia, right? You said that it is actually not a viable way for us to fight for uh, the right to be a Muslim country. Right now, we are not a Muslim country. We are not even an Islamic country, right? So, do you think that uh, uh, this political party are just obsolete? We should just throw them away? Mm -hmm. Or is it, this is maybe a way for us to express ourselves? And one more, uh, what do you think about the uh, people revolution in Syria, Egypt, uh, cast away Libya because it, it is being handled by NATO and everything, right? So, is it a way, uh, how can I say it? for us normal human beings to not rebel but to grasp the real root of being a Muslim that, that's all, thank you Okay. 22 years ago I believe 1980, 1988 1988 will be 23 years ago you do maths in this university <laughs> 23 years ago I came to Malaysia for the first time. I was based in Pakistan at that time. I was the head of the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies. And then shortly after that, I moved my base to the United States. And I remained in the United States until 9-11. When I left, and I've never been back in the United States since then. When I came to Malaysia in 1988, I came at the invitation of the Muslim Institute for Research and Planning in London which sent me to attend a seminar which they jointly organized with PASS on the Hajj and they put me in a hotel and I saw on the hotel a sign no durians so I thought maybe durians were beggars <laughs> <laughs> no durians in that seminar, I spoke as I did today to point out the folly, the folly, the mistake of the Islamic movement registering itself as a political party under a secular constitution, subject to the sovereignty of the state and the sovereignty of the United Nations and the sovereignty of the Security Council of the United Nations. I thought it was an exercise of total foolishness to register yourself as a political party and to fight elections in order to win power and to rule. It was a manifest departure from the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and uh, Pas didn't like it at all. But the Malay are so polite. Mashallah, they're such a polite people that after the conference was over they sent me around the country and there was a young man who was attached to me and to two other scholars and they sent us to Malacca and they sent us to Joho and they sent us to Kotabaru and they sent us to Kuala, Kuala Teringanu and I had the chance to meet Ustaz Nikablazis and I was amazed we went into a small wooden house and we sat down on the floor and we ate with our hands and I said to myself, MashaAllah, what a wonderful place is Malaysia. And when he spoke in the masjid, there were about 10,000 people present. And if you dropped a pin, you could hear it. Such perfect silence. And then they took me to Kolan Terengganu and there I had to speak before 20,000 people. And there, there was another scholar named Bustaz Abdul Hadi. But this one was so silent, so soft and gentle. But that one was thunderous like thunder. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> and there was a young man who, our, who was our escort taking us all around. And he never smiled at all. So serious was this young man. <laughs> Name was Hussam Musa. That <laughs> was 22 years ago. But I told them that you're making a mistake. The same thing with Jamaat Islami in Pakistan. The same thing with the parties in Egypt and Tunisia and some. But not because we defer on this issue. Does that mean we are enemies and there's any need for boxing gloves? No, we can defer and still be brothers in Islam. What should you do? The answer is, do not depart from the Sunnah. Laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana ila akhil al ayah. This is the best model, this is the best example. And he did not enter into the system of shirk to operate within the system of shirk to bring Islam. No. He rejected the system of shirk. He opposed it. And he said, even if you give me the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, which means all the votes of KL, nope, I will not accept it. I am not going to participate in shirk. That was the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And he paid a terrible price for it. But in the end, Allah accepted his, his struggle. And Allah gave him success. And he is the most successful leader the world has ever seen in all of history. So if you follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ, Yes, then times are going to be very bad now, terrible now, but tomorrow you will succeed. Next question. Uh, if Muslims are to abandon the modern world and make hijrah to the countryside, leaving all modern communication devices, how do we know or make aware of the calling of the black flag or, I mean, Imam Hadi, the coming of Imam Hadi? Okay. The, the question there, has raised the subject about my view concerning our response to the challenge of the modern age. It is very convenient to live in the cities of the modern world. It is very convenient to use this apparatus, you may have seen it, something called a cell phone. It is very convenient to have something called the internet. It is very convenient to have a motor car. Hmm? These are the conveniences of the modern cities. But Surah Al-Kaf of the Quran points to the reality of the modern age. The Dajjal is in control of the cities. For example, the Prophet spoke alayhi salatu wasalam about one of the signs of the last day. That you'll find naked barefooted shepherds competing with each other in the construction of tall buildings. Have you ever been to a place called KLCC? The tall buildings, where you locate the tall buildings, that's where the jar is in control. So if you want to preserve faith, you must try to get away from the jar. He said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, he spoke about a feminist revolution. And uh, it will be women who will come out to the jar. The last people to come out of Dajjal will be women. 1400 years ago he told us that women would be dressed and yet naked. When last have you been to a shopping mall? Huh? Women dressed and yet naked. He said that women would dress like men. I hope I don't offend anybody here tonight. 
but uh, you will see them with a jacket and with the trousers and with a tie yeah and when you see that tears should come to your heart this is what he spoke about 1400 years ago the Dajjal is going to do this so wherever you see the footprints of Dajjal woman dressed and yet naked woman dressed like men men dressed like women now don't be annoyed with me I have a job to do the first thing that a man has to do if he wants to dress as a woman it matters not how big your beard is that's irrelevant the first thing he has to do is to shave his beard uh, you can be annoyed with me now but after the lecture we can be friends They did it. The, the Judeo-Christian Western civilization, they shaved off the face of the male. And so a handsome, handsome man, that's what you want to marry, handsome man, doesn't have a dirty beard on his face. So if you want to marry me, shave off that beard. Yeah. When you see these things, you know this is Dajjal. He's in control. The age of Dajjal will be the age of Kathra to Riba. So you go to the bank and you borrow money on interest to buy, to build, to buy your house. Huh? All sensible and civilized Malaysians do that, don't they? And you go to the bank and borrow money interest to buy your car. All sensible and civilized Malaysians do that, don't they? And you say goodbye to the Quran. And you say goodbye to Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam when you borrow money and interest. Oh yes, go ahead, borrow it. Tomorrow you're going to be a slave. And you deserve to be a slave tomorrow. That's what's happening today. When money loses its value and you still have to pay back your loan. And you'll be crying tomorrow. Hmm? So the cities are today the centers of the Jaws attack. And my solution has been, get out of his grip. Surah Al-Kaf of the Quran teaches us the story of the young men in the cave to flee to the remote countryside. Sure, when you get to the remote countryside, you're not going to have the conveniences of the city. But at least you'll be able to preserve your Islam. That's more important. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Uh, I was your meeting, uh Hadith of Rayat uh, al-Sud is a black flag. Uh, I want to know the degree of that hadith. Is that muttafaq uh, ali, sahih, hasan? Because uh, we're listening from another uh, sheikh, al-Mahdi uh, al-Mutbar, will appear in Medina and he will go to Mecca to be there. Is that right? Thank you. I fail to understand why there should be so much controversy today on the hadith about the black flags of Khorasan. There are two hadiths, not one. That the black flags of, that will emerge from Khorasan would move unstoppable until they reach to Jerusalem. Hmm? That army will liberate Jerusalem. And then the second hadith said, when you see those black flags, Imam al-Mahdi will be in that army. Go and join that army even if you have to crawl over ice. Hmm? For 1400 years of our history, the consensus of the Ummah has been to accept these hadiths for 1400 years. Those who have a problem with these hadiths will fine. I don't have to ask you to accept them. All right, and to come now and tell us that this, these hadiths are naive, they are inauthentic and so on, it's another controversy, another discussion that is not beneficial for us. If you have a problem with the hadith, leave it. But don't come after us with boxing gloves. We don't have a problem with the hadith. Even if a hadith is not considered to be sahih, 
even it is considered to be da'if, it is not fabricated. There's a world of difference between a fabricated hadith which is in Bukhari, where you can't see, but I can see. The monstrous lie that Nabi Muhammad married me when I was six. Huh? The monstrous lie, the fabrication. In the first place, he never married her. How can you say he married me? He never married her. There was never any marriage ceremony. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose her as his wife. Everybody knows that. So Allah married them. A marriage ceremony, any schoolboy would know. A marriage ceremony is one in which the girl has a choice to say yes or no. So if you marry a girl and she doesn't have the choice to say no, that's marriage ceremony is invalid. You're going to marry her again. She has the choice to say yes or no. All right? But if Allah has ordained this is your wife, how can you marry her? She has no choice in the matter. So there was never any marriage ceremony here. No. And the hadith which is in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, all over the place, saying that Nabi Muhammad married Aisha radiallahu ta'ala when she was six is a monstrous lie. It's a fabrication. There's a world of difference between a fabricated hadith and a hadith which is considered to be da'if. You don't reject the hadith because it's considered to be da'if. What you would not do is to use a weak hadith for purposes of law. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Shaykh, uh, we see you, uh, uh, first I introduce myself, Ali from Jordan. Uh, we see you before on YouTube, you predict the Arab revolution, the current Arab revolution now. So my question is, what is the main reason of that revolution? And if you have any further prediction for that revolution? Thank you very much. Okay, on my website, there is an essay that was written uh, in early March. In early March of this year, I had just left Trinidad and I spent one week in Caracas, in Venezuela. And during that one week, I wrote that essay. An Islamic response to the current Arab uprisings. As, we, as long ago as March of this year, I anticipated that the Arab uprisings are of two kinds. One which is spontaneous, which is a, an uprising, as in Egypt, as in Tunisia. And the other which is not an uprising, it's an insurrection. An armed insurrection, a long planned armed insurrection, which is Libya. In that essay you'll find it. So you must be able to distinguish between the uprising and the insurrection. And I said that this is not happening by accident at this time. They oppressed the Arabs for 40 years. The Arabs faced bitter, bitter, bitter oppression from rulers installed by the Zionists, protected by the Zionists, assisted by the Zionists to impl implement monstrous oppression on the Arabs, particularly those Arabs who follow the way of Islam. After all those years of drought, they now bring what they call the Arab Spring, because you know spring means rain and fall. That's why they choose the word spring. And I said that the Arab Spring, the uprisings, which are going to bring what the Western world calls democracy, I can close my eyes and I can say to you, this is March of this year, that the Islamic parties are going to win landslide. How did I know that? I am not a prophet. <laughs> don't be foolish. I don't have any angel or any jinn whispering into my ears. Don't be foolish. 
I came to that conclusion based on my study of Islamic eschatology or ilm akhir zaman because I'm studying the Jal. Israel wants to wage war on the Arabs in order to establish an Israeli political and economic dominion over the Arabs. If Israel is to rule the world, the first people that Israel must rule are the Arabs. But Israel cannot wage war on the Arabs with wars which should look like naked aggression. Israel must be able to present to the world some causes bella, some justification for waging war. And so way back in 2002, in Sydney in Australia, I gave the lecture uh, beyond September the 11th, what does the future hold for Muslims? 2002, uh, September 2002 I was in Australia. So this lecture was about nine years ago. And in that lecture I said that the Arab uprisings are going to come and as the Arab uprisings come and Islamic parties take control of governments, Israel and the Western world are going to respond by saying Islam is now re-emerging as a threat to the world. Islam is now posing itself as a menace to Israel and to mankind. And the war on Islam, of course, is being waged to indoctrinate people, to brainwash people, so that people will accept this ac uh, accusation against Islam. And when you make this accusation that Egypt is now waging, preparing to wage war, then Israel can wage her wars and get away with the claim that we're only trying to protect and defend ourselves and we're trying to save mankind from Islamic terrorism. Mm -hmm. So this is what is coming up in the so-called Arab Spring. And it's such a pity <laughs> that the Islamic parties, the Islamic movement in the Arab world don't have a clue, not a clue, of what lies in store for them. Shem, what would we students of today or, or say Muslim scholars of today, what should we do to prepare ourselves to become the Islamic leaders of tomorrow? Because I feel this question is very important because it would be shameful for us to leave this hall today not knowing what to do. Thank you, Sheikh. MashaAllah. By all means, study electricity and magnetism <laughs> and heat and light and sound, particularly heat because I asked for some tepanasi, it wasn't panas at all. <laughs> But in addition, you must begin the process of education with the Qur'an. The Qur'an must remain the foundation, the heart of your education, all through. And you must end your process of education with the Qur'an when you're going down in the grave. All through your life, the Qur'an must be the supreme guide. And you cannot study the Qur'an. And you cannot understand the Qur'an without one who was sent to teach the Qur'an. He was not only sent to teach the Qur'an, he was sent to live the Qur'an. And that's Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Give me a few minutes. I graduated from the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Pakistan in 1971 with Al Ijaza Al Aliya from the Institute, which is equivalent to a bachelor's degree. As Kamil will be the master's degree and Takhassus will be the PhD. So I got the first degree. But I also had a master's degree in philosophy from Karachi University and I went back home to Trinidad. I applied for a job in the Foreign Service 
because my teacher said to me I don't want your hand like this I want your hand like this I know the character of the ummah today you become the imam of a masjid you got to sing the tune you got to dance to the tune that they sing huh? you lose your freedom I want you to have your independence so go and get a job so I applied for a job in the foreign ministry and they interviewed me a battery of people with a psychologist and a diplomat and so on. and they said Mr. Hussein you're the kind of man we love to have in the foreign ministry but we need to send you back to the university to study international relations would you go I said certainly sir thank you very much and they gave me a scholarship so I went to the Institute of International Relations of the University of the West Indies to do a postgraduate diploma after which they sent me to Geneva to do the PhD but this postgraduate diploma the class had about 23 students and you had to fight your way to get into that class oh yes lots of applicants but only 23 chosen most of them were diplomats in different foreign ministries and they're all university graduates French universities British Canadian American and the University of the West Indies and only Imran Hussein poor fella with a Pakistani degree so everybody looking down at me with my Pakistani degree oh wait a minute when the classes start we're studying international economics international trade and development international monetary economics I know nothing about the subject and next to me is this fellow with a master's degree from the London School of Economics I have to study international politics, I have to study international law, I have to study the conduct of diplomacy, I have to study the history of international relations. But it quickly became evident in that class that I was one of the better students. Superior in my understanding to all of these diplomats what was the reason the answer was that I took the Quran and the Prophet was with me in the classroom that's the answer and my teacher gave to me the methodology with which I was able to apply the Quran to international monetary economics as a result I could write this book today huh? when the exams came at the end of the year guess who came first <laughs> guess who came first the fellow with the Pakistani degree <laughs> and in the exams of international monetary economics not only did he come first he beat the fellow with a master's degree from the London School of Economics huh? I don't say this to you with any pride or arrogance I just share this with you so you'll know the value of studying the Quran and applying the Quran to whatever branch of knowledge that you are pursuing. You're not going to penetrate the Quran until you submit to the Quran. No, the door of the Quran has to be open to you. And in order for the door of the Quran to be open to you, you have to first learn this lesson, which my teacher taught me. Once you accept that this is the word of Allah, then whether you understand what is in the Quran or you don't, whether you are comfortable with it or you are not, submit to it. Submit to it understanding can come afterwards reason cannot sit in judgment over the word of Allah when once you accept that it is the word of Allah that's disrespect so having accepted that this is the word of Allah you now approach it humbly with intellectual humility secondly you have to have familiarity with the Quran suppose I don't know if this will happen you are in the grave 
and the angels come and the tests now begin and you don't have any of your professors to help you in the grave and the angel hands you a copy of the Quran and the angel says recite and you ask the angel could you kindly give me a Bahasa copy <laughs> I can't read the Arabic. That's when you might get the first slap on your face. <laughs> or when you take the copy of the Quran and you start to recite, you are stumbling over the words. You understand the word stumbling? Huh? You are stumbling over the words. Why? Because you never recited the Quran. No. You never recited the Quran. The Quran was sent for you to recite, not only to study but to recite. And so you and how to recite the Quran answer from cover to cover. That's the way to recite. Your grandfather used to do it before television came. And before the internet came and before McDonald's hamburgers came. Huh? Your grandfather used to recite it, your grandmother used to recite it. And the best time to recite the Quran is in the morning. So if you want to penetrate the Quran, to understand the world today, you better start by learning to recite it in Arabic, number one. Number two, reciting it constantly, constantly from cover to cover, cover to cover. When you finish, you start again. When you finish, you start again. And you do that for the rest of your life. Okay? And then after that you pursue the subject of studying the Qur'an using the proper methodology, not the lazy man's methodology. And may Allah bless your effort that you, you may get a chance to penetrate the Qur'an. The Qur'an may be able to explain to you the world today that you would never ever be able to understand without the Qur'an. <laughs> ولا أقوى على نار الجحيم الله فهب لي التوبة ووفير ذنوبي فإنك غافر الذنب Dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku, ampunkanlah dosaku. Sesungguhnya engkaulah pengampun dosa-dosa besar. Tuhanku, aku tidak layak untuk syurgamu, tetapi aku. Tidak pula sanggup menanggung siksa nerakamu Dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku Ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Ilah,
Allah, Allah.